journalist Michael Crick, who has written a biography of this man. Let June the 23rd go down in our history as our Independence Day. And that was, of course, Nigel Farage, the man who led UKIP for many years and who helped create the political conditions for Brexit. Now, I could do worse in teeing up this conversation about Nigel Farage than reflecting some of the comments to The Times this week in response to a review of the book we're about to talk about. So here, here are some of them. James Ross says, We all owe a huge debt of gratitude to Nigel Farage. He gave a voice to the majority of our people who never liked the EU. Whereas Swiss Nick says, Con artist. So sorry so many fell for the nonsense and destroyed Britain's reputation, integrity and dignity. He will go down in history along with our alleged PM as an opportunist, a populist nitwit. Uh, Finn says he sees the world through the eyes of your average bloke, which is why he's considered odious by the political classes. And Alistair Scott says, like him or loathe him, there's no doubt Nigel Farage has been the most significant British politician of the 21st century so far. We'd like to know what you think about this, about him. So do get in touch. You can text us on 87222. Start your message with the word Times. You can tweet us at Times Radio. You can email us as ever at studio at times.radio. So Michael Crick's book is One Party After Another, The Disruptive Life of Nigel Farage. And it's out now. Michael, welcome, Michael, welcome to the studio. Thank you. Thanks very much for being here. Look, for this book, you conducted 300 interviews with people who, who, who know Farage or have interacted with, with him. What, what kind of big common themes did you get from those interviews? Well, uh, his ruthlessness, <laughs> his resilience, um, and his brilliant communication skills and his utterly dire organisational skills. <laughs> uh, I mean, if, t if Nigel Farage would be it was Prime Minister, uh, the government would be in even bigger chaos than it is now. I mean, he shares that with Boris Johnson. He shares his communication. I've, actually, I think he's a, a better communicator than Boris Johnson because he, he, he covers the whole range. You know, mm -hmm. he's now a professional uh, television and, and radio uh, host, but uh, and he does those extremely well. He's great on a conference platform. Um, he's great in the parliamentary chamber, particularly the European Parliament. He made the European Parliament. He worked out how to make it interesting. But above all, and this is where I think he exceeds with uh, Boris Johnson, he's great communicating with the ordinary man in the street. He loves doing that. Mm. He loves listening to what they have to say. He loves interacting. He loves arguing with them. Uh, whereas Boris Johnson, I've always thought, is a bit uncomfortable about doing. He loves the adulation, does Boris. Uh, and uh, Nigel Farage loves the adulation too. But he really does get on with ordinary. A lot of politicians hate talking to ordinary voters. It's the last thing they want to do, is actually go out and campaign in the is, traditional way. Is there any fracture then between the, the sort of public persona of Nigel Farage and, the, and the, the, the personal impression of him people who know him have? Or are they pretty similar? No, there are. There are differences. I mean, in private, he can he, he is... He does get down a lot. Uh, you know, he feels things are not going well. He has his black moods, loses his temper a lot. You know, this ebullient uh, character that we see a lot of the time is, is can often be very different in private. That wasn't helped by his uh, plane accident, uh, which caused back problems mm. and, and still does for, for many, and a lot of pain uh, during the, the teen years when he, he often could get really unpleasant with, with colleagues and, uh, uh, and bad-tempered and, and uh, you know, we didn't really see that in public. Um, and, of course, the, great, the other great thing about Farage, and indeed a lot of people, is he's a man of great contradictions. I mean, here's a man, you know, who loves uh, annoying the establishment and yet he's desperate to belong to the establishment. Desperate to, yes. <laughs> you know, he loves going to old boys' events at Dulwich College. He probably attends more of them well, than any other is old that, boy. Is that, is that um, I mean, what is that? Is that resentment? Is it resentment that he's not more in the establishment that makes him... There is a lot of resentment there, certainly now. You know, he resented the fact that the, 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 the May government uh, and, and the Foreign Office didn't consult him about what you know, what he'd learned talking to Trump a few days mm -hmm. after Trump's victory when he made that famous visit to Trump Tower. Uh, you know, he resents the fact that they've never they've never offered him a, a knighthood or a peerage. Actually, I think it's to his advantage they haven't because it helps preserve that sort yeah, it would, of would, outsider would, image that, you know, that they're being persecuted by the would, establishment. Would, would have been a good way to neuter him, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, in, in, his, it yeah, yeah. In, in his uh, review of, uh, of your book last week, David Aronovich in, in The Times, uh, he said that Farage had hitched a ride on a bandwagon that was already in full motion with Brexit, which of course be Farage's legacy. Do you think that's right? How big was his role in Brexit? I think his role uh, was substantial in Brexit. In fact, I think without Farage, I mean, uh, it wouldn't have happened. Uh, after all, the result was very close, 52-48. Uh, and, you know, there were all sorts of other figures involved, uh, and some of them earlier than, than, than Farage. You know, it goes back to Enoch Powell and, and James Goldsmith and, uh, and Bill Cash and people like that. But the thing about Farage is that he constructed a political party uh, that threatened the Conservatives so much, together with their own malcontents on, uh, uh, within the 
Conservative Party, that the, the, the Cameron government was forced to concede the referendum. Mm. I mean, the great irony is that Farage didn't really believe in holding a referendum on Europe. He thought the way to uh, uh, bring about uh, Brexit, or it wasn't called that at the time, uh, was the parliamentary route. Get, mm. get UKIP MPs elected, join up with Conservative uh, Brexiteers, as they weren't called then, uh, and, and do it through Parliament, which was actually a bonkers way of doing it. It never would have worked. Um, but he was very, he was quite hostile to a, to a referendum. Uh, but then, uh, you know, Cameron conceded it. And, um, and, and the other crucial thing about Farage is that he, not only did he help win that referendum in 2016, although his role in the campaign, uh, he, he wasn't the, the leading figure in, in, in the actual referendum campaign itself. But I think it, the way in which it had sort of an official and an unofficial uh, wing to it uh, on the Brexit side yeah. actually helped the Brexit well, vote because it enabled people to vote, say, what, uh, more moderate Brexiteers to vote Leave, to, to say, well, I'm voting for vote Leave and Boris Johnson and Michael Gove. And for the more, uh, the people who are more concerned about issues like immigration uh, would be reassured how, by Farage. How would you balance the various impacts? I mean, if you had to line up people to take the credit slash blame for Brexit and you had, what well, you had Boris Johnson, you had Dominic Cummings and you had Nigel Farage, how would you rank them in terms of their, uh, their significance? Well, I think in the, in, uh, if you just took those three, I mean, mm -hmm. if I was considering it, you know, you probably have dozens, but if you took yeah. those three, I and mean, we go back to, you know, I mentioned Powell, Tony Benn, and, but if you took those three, I think that Farage was a more of a long-term, uh, uh, had, had more of a long-term role. I would also argue that what happened with Brexit and, and the other bit we haven't discussed, which is, is the Brexit party, which changed the whole scene in 2019, although the Brexit party very nearly didn't exist. I mean, it was only at the very last minute uh, that there was a whole series of... Uh, there was basically the founder had all the levers and sh she was refusing to relinquish them to Farage. Uh, and it very nearly collapsed at the last moment and wasn't able to fight the Euro elections. They were able to fight them. They trounced the Conservatives, pushed Theresa May out of office, persuaded the Conservatives they needed an answer to Nigel Farage, or I think they exaggerated mm. the threat from the Brexit party. But that was frequently the case with UKIP as well. Um, and, it, you know, he not only pushed it, that then led to Brexit and a deal and everything, um, but uh, and Boris Johnson, of course, um, but also it transformed the whole of our politics right now. I mean, we keep talking about the Red Wall. Yeah. Well, these are all constituencies or nearly all constituencies where actually it was UKIP. Well, they were, th th it was UKIP that did well first before. Uh, the Conservatives, UKIP paved the way. They were the sort well, of John the Baptist, uh, as it were. To, to sorry, no, 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 no absolutely. I mean, I, I agree with you, but yeah. I, I mean, to, to go to UKIP, um, you, you you quote in the book, um, uh, I think it's UKIP press officer Gwen Towler. Yes, he says I've, I've served under nine UKIP leaders, four of whom were Nigel Farage. Mm. And I mean, you look at you look at UKIP under Farage, although I suppose more so not under Farage. And it's, I mean, it's a basket case of a party. It's chaos, it and yet it's had this enormous success. What some. Yeah, it's a bit What's like my football there? club, uh, Manchester United. You know, it had all these great years under Nigel Farage or Alex Ferguson, and, and the succession wasn't properly secured. And the reason for that, probably in both cases, but certainly in Farage's case, is that he purged <laughs> anybody who was any good. Right. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, the most notable example being Suzanne Evans, who mm. I think would have been a good successor. Um, uh, but Farage didn't like anybody who threatened him, uh, who not only threatened him as a possible challenger to his leadership, but also, you know, threatened his reputation. That you know, that, that he, he he couldn't he couldn't stand the idea that UKIP might end up might he might be followed by a leader as as good as him. And it was a you know a, a, a battleground, and they all hated each other, and uh, uh, and there was no policy involved. It was all personality, <laughs> mm. uh, very little policy involved, as, as so often it is in politics. But Farage had this habit, and it, it recurs again and again in the story of bringing people on and encouraging them to get involved in the in the UKIP and later the Brexit Party, and then falling out with them mm. big time and purging them or excluding them and making sure they don't become parliamentary candidates. I mean, Neil Hamilton would be one example. Yeah. He fell out with Robert Kilroy Silk, whose career he'd he'd encouraged, Suzanne Evans, as I mentioned, and, and and several others. And that is one of the recurring stories of the um, of the of the Farage story. Well, I mean, the big so the big thing, the big theme of what he did with UKIP and then the, brec the, the breakfast party, the Brexit party, <laughs> the, the amount of people I've mocked for saying exactly that. My God, um, <laughs> the, the, the the big theme of what he did there, which was essentially taking what had been a quite sort of tweedy academic, let's leave Europe party, and, and, and sort of, with sort of uh, libertarian ideals, I suppose, and then turning it into this force that 
that not only took sort of conservative voters, but also, I mean, the, I think the one thing you, the one thing I, I, I'm happy to say is Nigel Farage's credit. He he claims to have to have killed the National Front and the BMP, and he kind of did. But to to bring those people into a more mainstream uh, kind of party, how much of that was he doing on purpose, or is it just force of his kind of instinctive personality? I think he I think he realised that uh, very early on, actually, that the Brexit part, that, that the UKIP weren't going to survive just on uh, you know. Surrey and Kent golf cubs and retired colonels, particularly as retired colonels, mm. were, you know, fought in the war, uh, were dying out. Uh, and that there was this great constituency of disaffected uh, Labour voters uh, all over the place, but predominantly in the in the Midlands and the North, which, of course, is now the bedrock of was the bedrock of, of the Conservative victory in 2019. And also the issue of immigration, which Farage um, yeah. uh, uh, you know, started going big on in the uh, well, around about the time of, of Britain failing to or, or deciding not to uh, adopt transition transitional controls uh, by Tony Blair. And then, of course, there was a huge influx that nobody was really expecting. Uh, and there are all sorts of reasons for that. Mm. Um, and that um, uh, played very well for UK. But for several years, the BNP under Nick Griffin were actually trouncing. Uh, UKIP under Farage for about three years. They used to get sort of twice the vote in by-elections. And, you know, but the BNP beat UKIP in Henley and, mm. and, and all sorts. And it really didn't look great. And then one of the great, the wonderful accidents that arrived uh, was the NP's expenses affair of 2009. And suddenly all the people uh, who might have voted for the traditional parties in the Euro elections... Uh, Conservative Labour Lib Dem, or might have voted for the PMP. They all, they all, a whole load of people deserted the traditional parties in disgust of mm -hmm. the MPs' expenses scandal and uh, rescued uh, yeah. UKIP in the Euro elections, rescued Nigel Farage. Um, and uh, after that, actually, he was ahead of the BNP and the BNP fell apart. And of course, he's a more charismatic and, and a much better uh, leader and communicator than, than, mm. uh, than Nick Griffin. Uh, was yeah. but it was you know and the great ironies was that the beer that the, actually UKIP were you know even better at fiddling their European Parliament <laughs> election ex, uh, uh, European Parliament expenses than, than any of the other than, parties than but, uh, but, <laughs> but they were <laughs> suddenly had this great public disgust dis, bis, bestowed on them um uh, and, and a great boost and yeah. it was full of accidents I mean you know the the, the biggest of all is really the, the Tony Blair bringing in Parla uh, proportional representation for the European elections in 99, even though the House of Lords voted it down six times, Jack Straw was willing to give up and say, oh, well, let's not bother. Uh, and Tony Blair said, no, 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 we've got to go ahead with it. We've got to overcome the... We've got to veto it. We've got to use the Commons veto under the Parliament's Act. Uh, simply because I've got Paddy Ashdown on my back and he's annoyed because we never gave him... Uh, we never... You know, we promised to bring Lib Dems into government and we never did. We've got to give him something. And it was meant, meant to be... <laughs> <laughs> to be the great boon for the centre left, and, yeah, look, and, and look what happened. And, uh, so the combination of Paddy Ashton and, and, and Tony Blair uh, yeah. gave UKIP that ability to ha to get M MEPs elected. That brings that gives them status, and it g brings them vast sums of money sure. for each and MEP, much more than an MP gets. And on the, on they go, uh, Michael. You you stop short of labelling Farage. Uh, in certain ways in the book, shall we say. We've talked just, we were talking just now about the extent to which he, UKIP under him, usurped the BMP as the party of the right, took a lot of voters from the far right. In his review of your book that we talked about earlier, David Aronovich um, talks about, well, you, you, you talk about the, the various memories that some people have of Nigel Farage at school, about his comments about ethnic minorities, about Jews, about black people particularly. Um, and um, and 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 uh, David Aronovich says, says you, 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 sort of, you seem to sort of pull your punch there. Do you think that's fair? Uh, well, I, it's not surprising. Uh, I expected it. Um, I, 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 my heart of hearts, I cannot say that Nigel Farage is a racist. Uh, he was a racist. He was an appalling racist when he was a teenager at school. Uh, and uh, even worse, anti-Semite. Uh, and, you know, would taunt uh, boys at Dulwich College about how you, you, know, you should be gassed and things mm -hmm. like that. I mean, terrible stuff. Um, but uh, and Alan Sked, the first leader of UKIP, uh, well, the uh, the Anti Federalist League, which then became UKIP, uh, always tells the story of how he heard Farage. This would be in the early nineties when Farage was what in his late twenties, um, saying, "We don't need to worry about the the black vote; he'll never vote for us." God, God. Yeah. Um, now, uh, Ad uh, Sked is adamant about that and has said it many times. But I cannot find anybody 
uh, who will corroborate either that story or indeed Farage using that kind of language uh, anywhere else in his I mean, adult life. J journalistically speaking, this must have been annoying for you. Well, it uh, no, because it it it. it if, some, if one or two people had said, uh, yeah, I heard it, you'd then think, well, is it... But actually, the fact that nobody else corroborated it makes me think that it was either a one-off case. Uh, but I don't think that Farage does use that kind of... I don't really think he do is you, a, a racist. Do you think... But he... I think he panders to racism and a lot of... In a way that Enoch Powell did, in my view. Um, and I remember saying so when I was only a schoolboy. And, and, uh, and I think morally that is almost as bad. Well, but but do, I don't think that he, in his heart of hearts, is a racist. But do you think his politics are in, inherently racist? Because his Brexit politics are motivated very much by an anti-immigration stance as much as they are as an anti-sort of legislation stance. And his comments about, you know, uh, Polish people clogging up the roads and, and, his, uh, and his various posters, you know, the, the, the posters put out by, by Leave EU during the referendum that suggested we were going to be swamped by a gazillion Turks and so on. I mean, uh, is, is this just a man who, is, who, who knows what levers to pull or is this a man with a, with well, a, with, with a real belief there? I think there? That was, that, you know, there was a lot of electoral opportunism in there. Now, there are occasions when you think, yeah, well, that's, that verges on, you know, when he talks about taking the train home from Charing Cross and, uh, you know, he doesn't hear any, any English voices, it's all uh, foreign voices. Mm. Um, there are occasions when you think, well, is that racist? And you, you can argue about all of this. But I come down in on his favour on that in in his heart. I don't think he and, and the way he he uh, uh, deals with uh, black people and Asian people and and enjoys their company. And I, I just don't think he is he is a racist in that sense. But I think he is an opportun a, a political opportunist in the way that he exploits the issue. And you know, and Farage wasn't the only one to exploit uh, the immigration issue uh, in the referendum. Uh, the Vote Leave did. The official mm. lot did. And of course, um, you know, Michael Gove and Boris Johnson were warning about uh, Turkish immigration, yeah. even though, uh, and Johnson later denied it. Well, it was true that he denied saying it, but mm. he, well, he did. Um, and um, so that that's that's where I left. But I mean, there will be people who disagree with me there, and it and and it it partly boils down to how do you define uh, what a racist is? Um, and he gets he does get extremely upset. I know when when people say that he is, but. Um, uh, I I don't think he is. But having mm. said that, his party is undoubtedly. I mean, a lot of the people who did vote BNP uh, then well switch switch to and there's something but, but and they switched to other parties. You know, quite a few of them switched to Labour and and, and, and to the Conservatives too. You can't some... you can't sort of say go away. Yeah. Um, they, they, and, um, but... and 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 at the end of the day, uh, I think the other the other point to make is that Farage reflected the fact there was there were extreme concerns amongst the British public about immigration and that the traditional parties were not addressing those and were didn't want it debated. Is, is, and, and I think that, you know, to be fair to Farage, it, it, there, at least there should have been a debate about it in uh, for the last 20 years. And now, of course, there is much more of a debate and has been much more of a debate. Is that sort of thing, do you think, the, the root of his friendship with Donald Trump, and indeed, how genuine is that friendship with Donald Trump? He would have us believe it's very genuine. Occasionally, <laughs> you do sense that Donald Trump is perhaps struggling to remember exactly which Brit he is. Yeah, I think I think it's adulation. In, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he won't. Uh, he's just so thrilled. I mean, this is the the Farage who wants to join the establishment in mm -hmm. a way. You know, he's so thrilled to be there with the uh, American president. And during the Trump presidency, he had quite a lot of meetings. You know, he'd be meeting him two or three times a year mm. uh, over in uh, in Washington occasionally. And, here and yet, well, the job Trump... never turned up. <laughs> and the job, no, the job <laughs> of uh, British ambassador never turned up. And of course, he's he's always been actually. Farage was quite a Trump sceptic for a long time. And it was only just before that he, he actually met him in the summer of uh, 2016 that he, he sort of thought Trump was a, or said Trump was a good idea. I think uh, privately he, um, he doesn't agree with what a lot of what Trump says. And I think uh, he, he uh, particularly is not happy about, uh, you know, Trump's role in the, in the assault on the Capitol mm. and things like that. And, uh, um, but uh, it is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a slavish uh loyalty to trump um and and trump spot trump's people spotted farage quite early on because they noticed his speeches in the european parliament and farage's ability when given only 90 seconds mm. to actually craft the sound absolutely bites. get the youtube clip. Yeah, yeah exactly and to and to shove it all on youtube and make his name on youtube 
Yeah. And um, But there was a period of about four years, from about 2015 to 2018, when Farage adopted a much more aggressive politics uh, and, and teamed up with people in America who you know, who's where, uh, who, where, where it becomes much more questionable about whether they're racists and anti-Semites and people like, and, and also people like Steve Bannon. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they started trying to forge this international kind of uh, -right coalition of uh, nationalists involving yep. Sisi and Bolsonaro and Duterte in the Philippines. Uh, and some pretty young, oh, and uh, Victor Orban, some pretty, uh, some of them, some pretty unsavory mm. characters. And he was much more, also much more, um, uh, willing to, uh, I mean, one of the things he did at regular intervals, he had to team up in the European Parliament with uh, some pretty unsavoury characters yeah. there. Uh, and his tolerance of some of these unsavoury characters is, got worse during that period. Is, and then he moderated again, informing the um, the Brexit party. Um, and the, the interesting question is, well, was that, again, was that opportunism or was he, had, had he really gone through a phase of being... Um, of having a much harder, yeah. a very masculine which politics, is, uh, and is, I think I think it's a bit of each actually. Which is the real guy there? Yeah. Look, look but before I before I um I let you go as a former uh, political editor and political correspondent and all the rest of it, uh, you must be you did very well to get the title one party after another for you, for your book. I, I was so pleased with that. Many at the more time. coming. I thought, gosh, it's great. It works three ways. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, <laughs> but now I think, well, it'd be much more appropriate for for Boris. Actually, in Boris Johnson's case, it only really works two ways. But, uh, <laughs> well, imagine you're on location down the line, and I'm and, and and I'm giving you a minute and a half to talk about it. What do you think is what do you think is going? What do you make of what's happening at the moment with them? Um, well, I mean, Boris Johnson's. Parties? You know, he's not going to last. The, the, he's not going to last the year. Uh, he'll probably last a lot less than that. But we may have to wait. Tory MPs are not coming out in the sort of numbers yet mm. that you you know that it looks like it's imminent. But nobody really knows. But on past occasions, you know, you've had a lot more public names. Uh, on uh, just on the eve of getting the number of le yeah. the letters to, to Graham Brady, the chairman of the 1922. But I can't, I mean, the thing is that the, cons the uh, public opinion has been sh so shocked by the events of the last uh, few weeks that um, it, it's going to be very, very difficult for the Conservative Party to win it back again. The thing about this scandal is it's a very easy scandal to understand and it's a scandal that enrages many members of the public when they consider the sacrifices they had to make. Yeah. Many political scandals are incomprehensible to most people. <laughs> you know, the Westland affair. Can you explain? Yeah, you know, try to explain one, that. And, and, um, this, one, this, this, one, this one cuts to the heart. I think exactly. that's right. Yeah. And well, I think the Conservatives know that and the, the, their only hope of winning, it, winning back uh, the public opinion is to try and disassociate mm -hmm. themselves from from uh, Boris yeah. Johnson. But the trouble is, there's no obvious messiah figure in the wings yeah. in the way that there was like Heseltine in 1990, or indeed Boris Johnson himself or in, indeed, in 2019, or indeed another age, Nigel Farage. Well, look, thank, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. As Michael Crick and his biography of, of Nigel Farage is out now, and apologies for some of the language in the middle of that, but it was indeed in quotes. Thank you very much indeed, Michael, for, for telling us about that. <laughs>